All right, uh, let's see. So uh, I have a little uh, intro thing. Ooh. So, Ooh. <laughs> it's what I sent you, Tia, so you oh. already. Okay. Um, one of the things that was delightful about living in New Jersey was the frequency with which I would randomly encounter someone on a train or a bus or at the pharmacy, hauling a musical instrument around or practicing a script or sharing a story about working on or near Broadway. And for those who are watching who don't live and work with us, this area is an easy 30 minute car train trip from New York City. And so it's often a launch pad or landing pad for the big city performers. And my latest find is Tia Dion Hodge Jones, who's right here with us. And I just met her through the right group, which is the group creating these videos. And, and a little introduction for Tia. Tia is an actor, playwright, and director producer. And to give you a sense of her work, we'll name just a few of the many things she's done. She wrote a play called Puddin, which was accepted into the 2009 New York International Film Festival. And she's acted in commercials, had roles on Law and Order and One Life to Live, created a web series called Where's the Love, which was screened at the August 2015 Real Soul Film Festival held at the National Black Theater in Harlem. And, but most interestingly, for the purposes of today's discussion, she wrote a book in 2014 called Play Speak, which can be found on Amazon.com of 40 monologues for young actors. And she also coaches young actors. So when I met Tia, I thought, wouldn't it be great to find out what makes a monologue good? And I'm curious about this as a writer because my kids were involved in drama when they were in high school in South Jersey. And I went to monologue night and some of the monologues seemed awkward and over adult for the kids. And so, I was like, well, what it does make a good monologue and not just for teens, but also for adults. So here we are, found my person to answer my questions. So I asked the first question. Uh, Tia, can you give us an idea? Uh, what is involved on your part when you help teens audition on Broadway or for other things using monologues? And uh, people have asked me, is the usual length one minute or are some longer? And you can just go from there. Um, first of all, um, when auditioning for Broadway, I'll start with that. Um, the two students that I, um, well, there's been a few that we actually, and I say we because I work for a program. Um, this will be my 18th year uh, working at Performer Theater Workshop. And over the 18 years I've been there, we now have had four young people that are younger than me, um, who are, have been on Broadway and three, I believe that are on Broadway now in shows. Wow. Cool. Um, two of them are under the age of 11. Um, okay. So <clears throat> when they're preparing for Broadway, usually they're given their own sides. They, producers and casting directors will give them audition sides, meaning they're usually given um, part of the script, their side of the script, which means this. Okay. Um, and so we rehearse that. Okay. Um, specifically for monologue work, um, the students that I've worked with over the years, I write the monologues for them. Um, okay. And I've written for them either because they've had audition, uh, auditions for managers and agents, um, auditions for their school plays, um, okay. They need an arsenal. They need a couple, you know, in their bag of tricks. Okay. So they, they need to be ready to go with something. They need to be ready to go for something. And okay, I try to write for their personalities, but I also try to write something that will stretch them. Okay. Um, I also try to write because of something um, that I know when they walk into a, either a, an, an agent's room or a, an agent's office or a manager's office that they'll see a range. Um, okay. For my cute little ones, I want them to be seen um, so they're not just seen as cute, but also that they can play a dramatic part. Um, okay. Um, for my older kids, I want them to be seen not just for commercial work, but also for film and television and theater work. 
Um, okay. So I try to make things that are that speak to them as little human beings. I shouldn't say little. They are young people who are actors and probably make more money than I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. No, that's really good because that gives us a real basis for um, where you're coming from. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And it's interesting. It just sounds interesting what you do. Um, I used to work with kids for te teaching English and math. So but to pull out their dramatic side, that must be awesome as a way to make a living. So um, you mentioned to me when I sort of pre-interviewed you mm -hmm. that a good monologue is not merely a story. Mm -hmm. uh, can you go, go through that again for me here for everybody? I feel that I'm a, a good, a well-written monologue is active. Um, active meaning you're speaking, the person that is doing the monologue is speaking directly to someone or, or a group of people. Okay. So you want something from that person that you're speaking okay. to. Um, an actor should be able to read the phone book and it should be entertain, entertaining and exciting and that's great. But a well-written monologue an actor should be able to dive right in and know exactly who they're speaking to, what they okay. want from that person, what's happened just before they've come in the room, why they want what they want from that person. We should know relationship um, and it should be evident in that moment. If not, it's a nice story. And okay. nice stories are great to tell, but it's not a monologue. Okay, so uh, I'm just re repeating back to you what you said. So I'm hearing that if, if I were to want to write a monologue, mm -hmm. in my mind, there would be more than one person in the room than the person doing the monologue because there was a, uh, there was someone else that they're addressing. So mm -hmm. there was a bigger story and the monologue is a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I like what you talked about the, what they want because they're expressing a desire. And that, mm -hmm. I write poetry and that kind of works too. In poetry, you write about something you're obsessed about. That often makes a good poem. So I like that. There okay, always so. has to be an, an objective. If there's no objective, then don't speak. Okay. There's no, there's, if you don't want anything, why are you talking? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I love that. that was, that's really uh, helpful and thoughtful. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So given all that, which is really great stuff, are there topics or types of monologues that work well with teens as a whole? As a whole? Oh. Well, in other words, work better with teens than with 30-year-olds uh, or, you know, is there, because teens are a special place in their life. They're not fully developed. I haven't, I haven't found it yet. Okay. Um, I haven't found it yet. I think because, at least with the young people I've worked with, now don't get me wrong, I, I, I do put some breaks on, la on language. Okay. Um, there are things that I don't, I don't think parents would feel comfortable if I had a 12 year old say on stage uh, okay. in a certain setting. Um, but professionally um, on stage, let's say off Broadway, that's a different thing than in suburban New Jersey, if you know okay. what I mean. Um, but are there subjects? Human beings are human beings. Okay. Um, um. I don't yet feel that there are experiences that any young person um, what I say I would not have them go through, it would depend on the piece. It would depend on the young person playing that particular character. Um, I have yet to have the opportunity to write in that kind of scope. Um, traumatic pieces, um, life and death pieces. Okay. But do I think that are, there are topics that are off limits? Um, it would just depend on the actor, of course, and the subject, and if it was necessary. If it was a larger piece, I think, a play, 
Mm -hmm. um, but writing a monologue, it would depend on what it was being used for. So okay. in, in an audition setting, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. I was looking at the ones that you sent me. Yes. And I thought you really hit it on the head uh, with teens' concerns. You have one yelling at her dad who's picking her up um, about where she's going to live. And that is a teen crisis. So, I, you know, they have no more than you, th than you think you know about. Mm -hmm. And the one about... A friend who fell down the stairs. Um, That's one of my favorites. But it's like a scene at school. It's full of emotion, but it's about being at school at the same time. So mm -hmm. uh, I think you have kind of an instinctive knack just looking at the ones that I read. I, I've been told I have an, um, an instinctive knack, and I think that's because I'm immature. Um, <laughs> you laugh. Uh, but I have friends that are also on, and they know this is true. Um, and there is a part of my personality that has just never recovered from uh, junior high and high school and oh, maybe never from elementary school. So um, I think a lot of my, my work in connecting with the young people that I work with is I have a lot of empathy. Okay. Um, and... Um, I often will actually and, and literally bring my laptop to class my privates with my private students mm -hmm. and the pieces that you have in front of me were written in the five to ten minutes I was with them and I'll print it out and hand it to them and those okay. are the pieces that we'll work on for the next couple of weeks and those are the ones that they go into their meetings with the casting directors managers and agents and they've used to actually secure representation. Wow. Yeah. So you had a, your incentive right in front of you as you were writing those. <laughs> well, if, if I don't hear, I can't really explain it, but I'll hear their voice. Okay. In your head. And once I hear their voice, I just start typing. That's awesome. And what that. comes out is what comes out. And then we'll work from there. Um, I'll ask them if they like it, if they don't like it, it's usually rare that they don't like it, uh -huh. um, but we'll work on it and we'll master it. We might cut it down some. I will overwrite, but I rarely underwrite. Um, and we'll piece it together to make it that one minute, maybe a minute and 30 seconds. So it fits the time that they need to you know, get in there, get in the office. And it's my job to it's my job to help them get representation. If, if, if a young person wants to get out there and work, I feel it's my job to help them live that dream. Um, there's nothing more satisfying than either getting the email or the call from a boss or getting an email from a parent or a call saying they got it. That's all I want to know. They got it. And okay, then, I'm going to jump to my next question, although I think we've already answered it, so I'm going to go over it just to bring it up, but um, mm -hmm. what my question was is, what would you think about a rant or a breakup with a girlfriend or boyfriend, an argument about a curfew, a story of triumph? Does it all fit as far as... I guess so, yeah, none of those fit as far as having an objective or what people want. What's um, what was the first one? Okay, a, a rant in in poetry and and uh, Mo writing. monologues are always rants. Okay, <laughs> if it wasn't a rant, you would have two lines, and that's not a rant. Okay, yeah, I almost skipped the question because of that, but I'm glad I didn't because that's a nice. Um, point. The next the next thing you said about breakups. A breakup with a girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, I, I stay away from breakups. Okay. Um, I don't know if I've done a breakup with a girlfriend or boyfriend only because I've read a lot of, I've read a lot of breakup monologues. So if I do do something about a breakup, I usually put a twist on it. Um, specifically, I wrote a piece about, uh, um, a grandson talking to his grandfather um, that his grandparents had moved into hideaway pines 
and he's lecturing his grandfather about all the things the grandfather is doing with the other little biddies on the floor and all of his fam you know all of his new found friends now that grandma's gone oh, okay but grandma just moved across the hall <laughs> okay so there's your twist yeah and the twist is you know now that grandma doesn't remember you the truth is grandma doesn't have alzheimer's grandma's pretending she doesn't remember you because you've forgotten her okay all right so the real breakup is about him forgetting his wife now that they've moved into hideaway pines and he's off doing his thing Okay. But it's the grandson lecturing the grandfather about getting back together with grandma so she can stop pretending she has Alzheimer's. Okay. So you have a couple layers of complexity. So I like right. adding the complexity, but giving the young person the power. In okay. It. Okay. Uh, interesting. Thank you. Okay. So that, that's, that's, that's my way of doing a, a, a twist on the breakup. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Uh, we'll skip the other two. I, I get the point there. Um, yeah, so you uh, find a, an objective, but if, if it's something that could be trite, you try to add some twists. And yeah, some I, kid, kids have their first relationships and there's breakups and a, a, a friend hurts your feelings and it really, that's a nice story. Uh, but, in a, but in a complex world, we all have complex relationships. Kids have more relationships with their phone okay. than they often have sometimes during the day with the people that even live in their homes. Right. I'd rather have a, a monologue where they get to talk it out with okay. somebody <clears throat> and speak truth to it then have the same old for me same old same old back and forth about okay i miss curfew or i broke up with a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend to have that on those deeper <coughs> levels of what is the meaning of having this relationship and i have a real impact on my grandfather or i have a real impact on the little girl who sells cookies down the street and i think she's actually in the mob um or <laughs> yeah i do a lot of i do a lot of girl scout cookie mob things um, okay. <laughs> it's personal so anyway but i use a lot of humor to to talk about loss. I use a lot of humor to talk about rage. And I say this because I tell my kids so often, they don't realize that they act all day long. Okay. And then they come to me and they don't realize that I have to chip away at all the acting they do. They're like, well, no, no, I'm myself. And I say, no, you go to school and you act like everything's fine. You oh, act okay. like you're okay. Yeah. You act like, you act as if you put this mask on and as your teacher and as your in-house playwright, mm -hmm. I have to write monologues so I can chip away at that mask. Right. If you act this way and then I have to get to the gooey center of you so you can play this character. And this is actually who you really are. They don't rage because they're not allowed to. They try not to cry so they can be strong. They try not to be too chipper because people will think they're phony. They, they're trying so hard not to be themselves okay. that I try to write monologues so they have permission to be That's okay fascinating. with who they I really, are. Yeah. And really well expressed. I really like that. I like, and I like what you said. The short version of that was talk it out. When you yeah. said, you know, let's talk it out. That kind of means a serious conversation as opposed to just blah, blah. I don't want to do blah, blah, blah. And I'm mad at this, blah, 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 blah. You're, and that's, you know, and that's why a monologue has to be active and speaking to someone and not just a st blanketed story. Okay. Yeah. Very, you, can't get, uh, you can't get the truth if you're just telling a blanketed story. 
Right. It has to be focused to someone or maybe a few people because it has to be grounded in something true. If not, who cares? And, and I'm going to add to, to what you're saying. I'm hearing an emotional truth. It has mm -hmm. to, when you say you have to get, get all the way to the deep jelly center. Yes. Like, right. That's, you have to get to the emotional truth. Can I ask that to him? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just I make sure I understand this monologue stuff is what I'm getting at. This is a monologue performer has to inject their personality into it, and they have to really show emotions. Yeah. yeah. Have, Did I do yeah. this right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think I think added to it, they have to get past their fake personality that they take to school. <laughs> they have to get deeper to the real humanity. Yes, and and no. Okay. What, what I will say as, as a teacher is the wonderful thing about being with young people is, they're, is they're, they're on the cusp of allowing themselves to, they, they have to make choices. They're either gonna continue on a path to hide themselves or remember what it was like to be four when everything was wide open and you could be anything at any time. You could, scrape your knee and cry and it hurt and then five seconds later the world was great um when you're in injecting that emotion the truth is a monologue carries that if you trust you in that moment you don't have to worry about emotion it's always there okay it's always there it's buoyant it, it I'm having emotions right now. I'm excited. I'm yeah. not thinking about it. I'm not injecting it. I'm just talking. Guess what? Right now I'm talking to you. I want something from you. I want you to listen to me. I, I, I want to be heard and understood. I'm having a monologue. Okay. Yeah. I'm that having emotions. Really I don't yeah. have to do anything. My emotions are buoyant. It will carry me. I want my young people to understand if they allow themselves to just let the words carry them, they don't have to worry about injecting the emotion. I don't care about the emotion. I just want them present enough. I want them to chisel away the fear enough to get to that juicy center where they allow themselves to be carried along. Then, then human nature takes over. Cool. I'm ready to write some. I'm ready to do one. I want you to teach me. <laughs> Good. So let's see. We're we have technically, if it's 30 minutes, eight minutes left. So uh, Hank, you had a question. Does Carl have a question? Carl? I have some more questions if you don't. But Carl does, I think. Carl, okay, Carl. I have a question. Yes. Um, so uh, Tia, I know you wrote a book on monologues. Yes. Uh, that was Great. my really my only understanding. Of it. Oh, yay. I'm looking for it on my shelf here. I think I have it somewhere. Now, uh, if for some of our writers, is this something that can be uh, something that they can write as well for the purpose of uh, showing it or printing it or publishing it or giving it to aspiring actors to use? I mean, of oh, it sounds like a uh, you know a soliloquy in a play or some kind of you know, an Amamet play or some kind of other thing in a prose piece, but is there actually a market of sorts for writing? A, a there, there are, there is actually, um, and, and my mind is going blank, but um, mm -hmm. there are, are sites like Youth Plays, um, there's a few others um, that you can submit to for kids, especially who do forensics. Forensics. Um, Forensic uh, speech and debate. Oh, oh okay. And Thanks. they need 10 minute pieces. Um, those type of monologues are, are, are a little different. Um, those are more story type pieces. Okay. Um, so you have to be able to tell a story. But um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I am in the novel group and my prose is very monologue like it's just <laughs> okay how my brain works i okay. like to jump into my character's thoughts um i will say when i'm doing research or trying to figure out a character's um bio i sit and i write a monologue mm -hmm. i want to 
I want to jump into how they see the world. Um, and that's just, that's my nature. That's my nature as a writer. Um, when I, when I do get stuck, when I have a writer's block moment, I will, I will try to see that scene, but from a different point of view, like the guy on the street, like I'm having an, an issue with one, one particular character. And so I'm trying to see it from her shoes, I know this is weird, from her shoes point of view, because she has, um, she has uh, her feet, um, what's it called? I have it right in front of me. She has bunions. Okay. <laughs> I know, it's weird. But if you think about it, if a shoe had something to say about a person with bunions, at, okay. least, it, it, at least it'll keep honest to goodness, at least it keeps my fingers moving and my brain focused on what I'm writing. And okay. she would have issues with a person with bunions, don't you think? <clears throat> I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that before myself, but yeah. That's how I, I, yeah, I don't get out much. I just stay in front of my computer and type. So anyway, um, but I think, I think if, if there are other writers out there that um, not just, you know, playwrights and screenwriters or whatnot, but those of us who do write prose who just want to form up, what, what would this particular character sound like if not just speaking to somebody else or just in this moment? I use monologue writing to what do I want from this person? If I have free range to just rant and go off, what would this sound like? And what do I really want in this moment as this character? And I just write, just rewrite as a monologue. Is, is there a, a typical mistake? Someone switching from the, re the reverse of your situation, you're moving from monologue to, to novel, mm -hmm. but if a novelist who does a lot of description or to just suddenly try to write a monologue, what would be the most likely mistake that they would make i have no idea and i'm not gonna dare say anything about anyone else's writing okay <laughs> nope. I guess that's allowed. can't um, make me <laughs> are there any websites that you refer people to uh about monologues your students or my uh, students oh yeah. um i i have to be honest the reason why I started writing monologues for my kids is because I asked them to bring in monologues for class and they brought in stories that they found in monologue okay. books. It okay. was, they brought in monologue books and uh, they were just cute stories about, hey mom, why are you having a baby? So did you develop your ideas yourself or did you, by observing and watching and teaching, or did you pick yours up from uh, say drama school somewhere or? Um, I did go to Stella Adler Conservatory um, uh, when I first moved to New York. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, funny, when I was uh, at Case West Reserve University, my very first, my very first acting class, uh, acting 101, mm -hmm. was my last semester of grad school. Um, mm -hmm. I took uh, a wonderful class, and my teacher Beth um, said an, a monologue has to be active. And the monologue I wrote in her class, I used at to audition at Adler, and I got okay. it. So okay, I took that. Um, and I learned that if I could get into Adler with the monologue I wrote in Acting 101, then that's the way to do it. Okay, so you're sharing with us your acquired wisdom then. Great, thank you. <laughs> I guess. So any questions, uh, Carl and Hank? Are we out of time? Because it says remaining. No, we have, uh, we have nine minutes and 11 seconds. Okay, Ooh. great. Uh, I have yeah. a, a follow-on. Um, you mentioned the magic word free writing a moment yeah. ago. Uh, we, of course, have a free write workshop every Saturday morning. If we wanted to try a, uh, a prompt uh, to try a monologue, would I have to give a theme for it or just let everybody try to develop a, what, a 500 word or type of monologue and, and then see what they come up with? Um, yeah, um, I have, um... Gosh, I forgot what it's called because I use it for my improv class. 
um, I have a, um, a stack of prompts. It's, I'll have to share it with you, um, that I got on writerstore.com. And there's over a hundred thousand different combination of prompts. <laughs> and, and I, I use them when, again, when I'm having a little bit of writer's block, um, and, and prompts are great. Um, and I would say a monologue that only takes up maybe 20 lines. 20 lines. Yeah, because anything longer, it's just too many pages. Well, we, have 20 lines. we have prompts. Yeah. The 20 lines is what I was looking for. Yeah, 20 lines. A frame, a frame. okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's plenty. I heard yeah. something yeah. really interesting. And okay. you said you would, you're developing a character. You you get into you have a monologue with a character. Right. I think that's interesting. I got to try that. That sounds like it's a really great idea. Well, a good way you to get start to figure out how the guy thinks. Or yeah, and thinks. it really focus you focus you into you know what's in this person's head, but yeah. also what can also help is who what and this is this is an acting technique, but it it's also a good writing technique that I use is the who, what, when, where, why, how, whom, and what. So the who is, you ask, who am I? What is, what do I want? When, when is this taking place? Where is, where is this taking place? Who, what, when, where? Why is, why do I want what I want? Um, how is, how do I get what I want? Whom is, whom am I speaking to? And the last, the second what is what happened just before to have me speak. That's great. Thanks for rattling that off. That's awesome. <laughs> it, 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 it's in my book. <laughs> <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> plug, plug number 8,400. That's fine, yeah. So, and, um, and two. Very good. So for as far as um, directly for the pros prompt group or for the prompt group that that you have on Saturdays, which is generally just a one line prompt, but you could explain that it's monologues, but you could just set it, the prompt could be talk it out or the prompt could be I want this from you. Yeah. Or, or, or why can't you give me X or something? Or that. who am I and then where are you? So I'm a lion tamer in an elevator. With a lion. No, with a donkey, you know, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just switch well, it up. Do the elevators. Um, no, but, thank you. No, oh, no, thank you. Um, whatever, it can just, it can be anything. But it's, what's really important, honest to goodness, is whom and, and what happened just before. Because that speaks to relationship. Relationship is everything. Relationship is everything. I mean, when you're writing prose, it's nice to have a great description. Mm -hmm. But if there's no conflict, the right. relationship is what drives everything. OK. That's good. This is a really good compliment to the way I write because I, I'm known for lots of description. <laughs> so this so is where you I have great, great description. And, and I do the same thing. I have great description. And, and sometimes I get really into the description and I get into the heads of the people. But where's the conflict? What's yeah. happened? There's got to be action. And I, I like a lot of description. But once... Yeah. Once you've built that tension with, okay, who is this person speaking with? What do they want from? Or mm -hmm. what do they need? And why is this, why is this description so important? It's important because it's hanging out there for us to know relationship to what. Okay, I have a, a question. Um, we had talked most of the session about short monologues and then about Four minutes ago, you mentioned something about the eight or nine minute monologue being something different that is a story. Could you re-explain? In, in, in forensics, when kids do competitive uh, monologue presentations, okay, uh, their pieces need to be 10 minutes, between nine and 10 minutes. So, okay. and that's memorized work that's much longer. 
Okay. So that's a different like family of monologues. So if someone wants to write a book of monologues, there's this one minute, like I need to be able to perform on the spot monologue. Yeah. For audition purposes. The category is the nine or 10 minute competition monologue. Yes. Basically. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Okay. Yeah. Question? Hank or Carl? No, I don't have any. No. We have okay. three minutes left. Three minutes. Okay. Let's see. Most of my questions are sort of repeating the other questions because I think you have told us the essence of what a monologue is already. Um, let's see. Uh, tell us about two or three of your favorite monologues, things that worked really well for you. Oh, that's so or for your students. Fair. Uh, <laughs> fair. I'm always fair. No. <laughs> what, what's, what's holding you up about that question? Too many? Uh, well, too most of them are ones that I didn't write. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, you could talk in general about an effective monologue was one that did X. Yeah. Uh, I've had well, experiences with them that worked great. There's, there's one particular one that I, I work with a student uh, who's now on Broadway and Frozen, um, but it was for an audition, her, one of her auditions for, um, she was playing Helen Keller. Okay. And uh, it was a short monologue and it's the monologue she used to get the job, well, get the call back. Let's put it okay. that way. It was effective because I believe it was effective for her because it embodied the loneliness of, even though, you know, Helen Keller doesn't speak, but um, it embodied the loneliness and the devastation. It's about a, a young person who uh, is in foster care uh, in the system and um, is being given back to the mother that abused her. Okay. We're, we're um, just about ready to get cut off here. Okay. So, so, anyway. Okay. It's well, time to say goodbye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. This you was know, great. I, Thanks, I everyone. Love that. I loved hearing about your. Uh, 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 I loved glean, gleaning these bits of wisdom from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Carl. Bye, Hank. Bye, kids. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.